we're going to do in this class is we're going to take every one of those individual subjects you studied together, separately, and we're going to bring it all together in a nice holistic way. Right? This is why we call it a keystone course. Because we all know, especially the engineers, right? We all know what a keystone is, right? As long as that arch has a keystone, then all those individual little pieces, they're going to stand there for forever, right? You, you go to Turkey and you see Roman arches standing for 2,000 years. Take out the keystone, it all falls apart. Well, that's the idea behind this course. The keystone is what's going to take all your individual subjects, finance and accounting and statistics, and bring it all together. Okay, so here's the idea. We're going to work with you to figure out how to literally monetize um, everything you're learning in the MBA program by applying all that different knowledge to an innovation activity. All right? Now, when I say innovation activity, I don't mean a business plan. That's an old term that we won't use in this class. And and, and I'm not going to say a startup company, because that's too narrow. Startup is cool, but startup means it's new and it's for profit. But if you work for a bank, like my friend who you'll meet later in the course, who's on the board of directors of OTP Bank, director of strategic planning, uh, OTP Bank is always developing fintech. Well, fintech isn't a startup because OTP Bank already exists. And, 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 and nobody comes to them with a business plan for some new fintech, but they do, they do create an innovation plan, and they come to, to Eager with the innovation plan, and they convince him and the board that they're going to have benefits, however measured, exceed costs, however measured, right? So it's going to be profit. So we're going to use the term innovation activity, and what's fun about this course is when you guys finish, you're either going to go back to the company you currently work for, or the government you might work for, or the bank, right? Or you're going to go out and try to get a new job. And when you go to them, whether it's your boss and you, you want to raise because now you have an MBA, or you try to go get a new job, and you say, I have an MBA, I guarantee you what they're going to say. They're going to say, good. And then that's all they're going to say. Because if you don't have an MBA, they won't talk to you, right? I mean, you've got to have at least two college degrees nowadays, or nobody's going to take you seriously, all right? But that doesn't mean they're going to hire you, and, and, and it doesn't mean an investor is going to give you money. I mean, I... I know, I know most of the accelerator programs in Ukraine and in America, okay? Do something really smart, and I'll, if I see you guys doing something where I think I can make money, I'll plug you into my friends at their accelerator programs here in America. But the point is, you go and you say, I got an MBA, and I know, I know how to do finance, and I know how to do accounting, and they say, fine, so does everyone else who's applying for this job for trying to get me to invest money. But if you then say, oh, well, by the way, when I was at my MBA program, I started to work on this innovation activity. And I've got this innovation plan. Now, it's not complete, but I think I've done enough, you know, in terms of the design of the product or the service, the market research, you know, some, some of the financial work, some of the engineering work. I think, I think this can work. I guarantee you they're going to hire you over every other applicant or they're going to they're going to say, "Hmm, tell me about your idea, maybe I'll invest." Right? Because you will have done something rare in life. <laughs> you will have actually demonstrated you have the ability to do something, okay? Knowing how to to make a financial forecast doesn't demonstrate you have any ability to do anything. It just demonstrates you know how to do a financial forecast. I know how to ride a bicycle, but I can't join the Tour de France, right? So, so what? You know how to do a financial forecast. Would you come and show me a financial forecast supporting a really clever idea? And it'll be incomplete, because we're only out a semester, right? So I'm, I'm not expecting you to bring something that I would invest in. 
although if you bring me something worth investing in, I, I just might do that. Um, okay, so here's how this is going to work. You guys are going to think of an innovation idea, okay? And let's do a really quick, quick, quick survey. How many of you currently have a job? A couple people have them. Do you work for what? A corporation, a bank? Who do you work for? I'm an entrepreneur. You're okay. You're an individual entrepreneur. Good. Same. Who's Same. Same. Marketing company. You're working for a marketing company, and, and the rest of you are not employed. Okay, that's fine. Okay, that's fine. Don't forget. Just because we're in a business school doesn't mean we're going to talk about only startup companies and only for-profit companies. If you work for the city of Kiev in the transportation department and I'm your boss, I'm, I'm, I'm going to expect you to start coming up with a lot of profitable innovations, meaning business benefits outweigh the cost, profitable innovations that will get more people using uh, public transportation, using it more often, using it more efficiently. Right. So now, you know, I mean, it's only been very recently that Kiev's coming up with, you know, the card, like cities all over the world have, where you have one card, a lot of cities, I hope Kiev does it, where you have a, a card, and that one little card, you, 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 you just download money on the card from your, take the app, download money on your card, the card works at the bus, it works at the metro, it works at the train, you know? No, too bad for Kiev. Yeah. Okay. No, it works, right? Hmm? We're coming up with this system. But you have an app, okay? It's, right. It's, it's but somebody had to. We're coming up. It's implemented. It's going to be implemented. Good. In right. And it was probably developed by the smart city yeah. department at this. Right. Okay. That is really cool. All right. That is a, and it has to be. It. it that's an innovation. Okay, it's not a startup company because Kiev is not a company and it's kind of an old city, right? So it's not a startup, but it is an innovation activity. And, and if you don't develop an app that operates efficiently and gets more people using the, the public transportation more often, then it won't be profitable, right? I mean, it, cities, are, cities need revenue in order to, to repair train tracks and stuff. So so the people in the smart city department down there, Kiev City Government, that app they developed is no different than the app that that my one huddle company in America, we developed an app, it's a mobile based app for training using gamification technology. Okay? And we have clients, we have Hyundai, we have oh we have FIFA, talk about an awesome one. We have Emirates Airlines as a client. Okay, I mean that's pretty cool. Um, so, so, but that's a that's a and that's a startup and it's for profit. But it's the exact same concept as what the Kiev city government did with an app for riding on the train. That's why we're gonna we're not gonna use terms like startup or business plan because we want to include the whole world, right? Okay, so you're gonna come up with an idea, right? You're going to I'm gonna, we're gonna give you a questionnaire to fill out here online. You're going to come up with an idea, an innovation idea, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to, I'm going to help you because I'm going to give you about a hundred examples. <laughs> uh, you're going to form a team to work on your idea. Now, can't be more than four people because otherwise we get a free rider problem. Um, if if you're the kind of person who just likes to do everything yourself, fine, be a team of one. It's harder, okay, but some people just don't want to work with anybody. They just want to be a team of one. I, uh, the best teams are two or three. One is not good because, you know, you're not going to know finance as good as somebody who actually knows finance, okay? <laughs> and you're not good, right? Okay, you know, somebody here told me they got a, uh, oh, you, you've got a, uh, some, someone who already has a bachelor's in business or they studied finance or accounting, okay, they're going to they're gonna be a better partner for you than you if your background is engineering and, yeah, you're studying MBA. But, yeah, okay. but you can do one. I would recommend two or three. Okay, four is fine. Okay, 
but then it's going to force you to be a little more organized. <laughs> Two and three people is easy. Once you get four, it might as well be 400, okay, in terms of organization. You're going to develop and refine this plan, and you're going to demonstrate progress, okay? At the end of the at the end of the semester, well, and during the semester, but at the end of the semester, you're going to make a final presentation on your renovation plan. Don't panic. No one is expecting that in one semester you're going to stand up like you're trying to do a Series A funding round and present something so complete and so convincing that somebody says, "I'll I'll, I'll fund three million. We got three million on our Series A funding round." Okay. But you can't just stand up and say, well, I've been thinking about building a time machine, okay? Because then I'm just going to have a lot of fun beating up on you, okay? Because it violates the laws of physics, for, for one thing. Okay, so you just, you need to have something. You need to have touched the obvious basis, right? Every product, every service has a supply chain. They got a structure. They, they, have, they have marketing, they have some financial planning, they have some market research and marketing plan, they have some sort of financial idea, okay? But, so the, the elements have to be there, right? So if you come with a complete but, but kind of thin plan, that's okay. If you come with a plan where you just completely ignored such stupid stuff like marketing and finance, well, okay. So, so don't panic, okay? The key is to have fun thinking of an innovation idea. I'm gonna give you about a hundred examples here today of, of cool stuff. Um, so that's how this is gonna work, and you're gonna make a final presentation. Now, if, if you do something that is really cool, okay, you're gonna end up meeting during the course of this semester, you're going to end up meeting, you know, people that we all know here in Kia that are involved in, in IT and finance and you know, they're investors, they're this, they're that. So you, you may, if you really develop something really intriguing, these people are going to be very interested because that's how they make money. You think of me as like a lead consultant because through me is how you can act and Lubov too, but, but, but this is how you're going to access not only my support, my help, because I know, I know a lot of things, okay? You live long enough, you know a lot of stuff. I've worked in every industry from A to Z, okay? So, so I'm smart, I'm good. But uh, we, we all also have lots of friends <laughs> who are experts in a lot of different areas. And, and so you'll meet some of them, and the, we're all going to help be free consultants so you can develop this plan that you're doing. Now, um, my email kind of, oh, <laughs> I'll uh, write it on the board before we go. Well, you know how it turns blue and underlines? Yeah, well, there you go. It's a technical flaw. Yeah, because you can't see it. Um, I'll write it on the board before we go. Um, if you want to know more about me, you can go to my LinkedIn page. Um, because uh, it, it takes too long to talk about that. Okay, so um, here's what we mean by an innovation activity, okay? And again, nobody expects you're gonna bring up some completely, you know, fully developed thing, uh, okay? But, okay, it has to be a chair with four legs, <laughs> okay? But it doesn't have to be a golden chair. <laughs> so, uh, you're going to get a copy of all of these uh, slides. Um, this, is, this is what we mean. Uh, it, you're going to develop a product or, or, or a service or a program. Again, maybe you work for an NGO. Maybe you work for a public health agency. You know, some government, and you're developing a program. Say a program to uh, extend public health access in rural areas or a program to expand, uh, subsidize government housing. Okay, that's not a for-profit thing, but it is a program, and you have to innovate, you gotta create it, and it has to have benefits that exceeds the costs, okay? So you're gonna develop a product, a service, or a program, 
and it has to meet these four criteria. As long as it meets these four criteria, you pass the class. <laughs> I mean, no, seriously, okay? It has to be feasible, no time machines, okay? It, it has to, you, you, you have to con convince us that there's a, 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 a significant probability that it can be profitable. So if you come to me and say, I'm going to set up uh, an automobile factory in Ukraine to produce cars to compete with a Bentley, you're not, you're not ever going to convince me that you can do that profitably. But, 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 but I can give you a thousand other examples where, yeah, you can convince me that there's a significant probability that if you screw your head on straight, you can do it profitably. And it has to be sustainable, meaning, meaning you have to be able to convince me and others that, you know, if we do this and, and we do it in a, in a smart way and we're adaptable and we, we can sustain this activity, product, service, company, we can sustain this through time, okay? And, and it's sustainable in a, in a social way, an environmental way, okay? So don't don't come and say you're gonna you're gonna um, develop a coal mine because the coal mine is not sustainable. Very in a matter of years you'll be out of business because of environmental things, shifting energy technology. Okay, so a coal mine is not sustainable. <laughs> it's not even profitable, but it is feasible. You know, I mean, so and this is really key: socially responsible. I'm going to give you some examples of. They're, you know, companies, they're, they're, they're old companies doing new things, they're new companies doing new things, and they're raising billions of dollars in the capital markets. They're earning billions of dollars. Their, their, their market valuations of their companies are in the tens of billions, and they're in all of this socially responsible areas. Because human psychology, thanks to you guys, okay, <laughs> Right? Not my parents' generation and not, not your parents and my generation. Thanks to you guys, people demand that things have some minimum social responsibility now. Okay? Right? If, if that wasn't true, uh, for example, do you know who the largest investors are in renewable energy? Oil companies. Exxon Mobil, Royal Dutch Shell, those greedy bastards. Well, they're not stupid. They don't want to be oil companies. They want to be energy companies. And it's like, okay, well, okay, coal's on its way out and oil's on its way out. But, you know, but, but, but uh, electricity from solar and wind are on their way in. So you got a company like Exxon Mobil, by far the world's largest oil company, for the last five, six, seven years, they're investing more money into renewable projects than they are into traditional oil, gas, and, and, and well, in their case, no coal, just oil and gas. Okay? That's very socially responsible. They're not doing it because they're nice guys. There's no nice guys in the oil industry. I've worked there. So they're not like nice guys. But they, but this is what the this is what governments are demanding. It's what consumers are demanding. Okay, and so they're 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 shifting. So so we're looking for that too. Okay. Um, before we we're going to take a break here, please. I've already mentioned this, but this is what I mean by uh, I keep using the term innovation activity. Right? An activity has to exist inside of an entity, a legal entity. Okay, but it can be it can be a private for profit or a private not for profit, right? Okay, it can be public, meaning I don't mean like in the stock market. I mean public, like owned by the government. Okay, so it could be something public. Again, think of we were talking about the smart city guys down. The, okay, it can be public. It can supply a product or a service. Okay. Like the little cell phone app that you use on the buses and the metros now. Um, or it can be a public entity that's stimulating private or public innovation. Um, there's a lot of governments, 
Ukraine government, I'm convinced, uh, is a better government today. And they're starting already to move in this area where they're looking at public sector programs that will stimulate private sector economic development. Somebody in the Zelensky government has to come up with a plan. There's about a hundred of them. There's, a, that I'm aware of, at least a hundred plans on how to create a private land market in agricultural land, right? right? For those of you who don't know, you cannot buy, sell, trade, bequeath agricultural land. <laughs> it's a very, very, very complicated issue. And so the government says, we're going to pass a law, sounds easy, <laughs> we're going to pass a law that allows agricultural land to be bought, sold, and bequeathed, and pledged at a bank. Well, just, just, just sit down and try to write such a law. It is enormously complicated, legally, financially, economically, logistically, socially, emotionally, it's really hard to do. Okay? But if they if if that public if that public entity, in this case, I guess it would be the RADA, actually develops a, a sustainable, feasible plan for privatizing agricultural land, it is gonna stimulate public and private, especially private sector business development, capital formation, innovation. If they screw it up, then then it'll it'll you know go in the, the opposite direction if they do it right. So again, that's this is all innovation. Um, these don't exist in Ukraine. There is a and they don't exist in any of your countries. There's in, in some countries have laws that they call public private partnership, but they're not. Okay. If we have time going forward, I will explain what a real public-private partnership is. The largest public-private partnership in the world is in uh, Brooklyn, New York. It's a $250 billion, that's big, yeah? <laughs> that's like three years of Ukrainian GDP. It's $250 billion public-private partnership to between the city of New York and the state of New York and the U.S. federal government and a whole bunch of private entities to redevelop the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard where we used to build all of our warships going all the way back to George Washington, okay? And uh, it's like a 20 or 30 year project. Um, by, by the way, you could be an NGO. I've got a few examples of, of innovation activities I'll show you for NGO. And again, it can be existing or new. So if you work for a company, you might, especially if you work for a company, and you got a boss like me, okay, and I'm wondering, what the hell are you doing in Kiev for the last 18 months? And then you come back and you say, hey, I've got this really cool innovation idea. It's an idea. I've worked on it a little bit. I only had a semester, but I worked on it a little bit. And, and it's an idea of how this company can do something new and make more money. Well, man, your career working for me is on solid ground. Okay? And then I won't care what you did in Kia. All right. So um, we use this term innovation as if it's like one thing, right? You know, innovation. You know? But nobody ever stops to think, well, you, what kind of innovation? I mean, has anybody ever walked up to you and said, hey, what kind of innovation? You know, I mean, innovation, right? There's actually, uh, and this is like pure economics now, right? Because I'm an economist. Professor Zerov is an economist. This is economics. There's three, and this is all designed to help your thought process, okay? There's three kinds of innovation, and there they are, okay? Sustaining, efficiency, and market creation, okay? Um, okay, think about this. Sustaining innovations is most, this is what you see most in the world. But this is like, there isn't a lot of room to have fun here, okay? 
if I'm Roche, very excellently managed chocolate company in Ukraine. I'm not saying that because it was Porsche. Oh, I'm saying that because it happens to be a fact, okay? Roshan is a superbly managed, very highly profitable company. If Roshan decides, okay, I'm not making a political statement there, but if Roshan decides they're going to create a new type of chocolate candy, okay, that is a sustaining innovation, okay? All they're doing is, because they're an existing entity, they're, they're making variations on existing products and services and activities. They're a company that sells chocolate products, and they need to keep making new kinds of chocolate products. Oh, this one has a little orange flavor, and that one has a little cherry flavor. Because they have to keep their existing customers' brand loyalty. they got to keep them interested. Okay. And, and, and so they're just creating variations on a theme to maintain their customer base, maintain their brand loyalty, okay, and compete against Nestle that's doing the same thing. So there isn't a lot of new, exciting, innovative stuff going on here. It's extremely important, but this is mostly what existing companies do. Okay? And they're doing it for these reasons. They want to make market share. And, or they want to compete against Nestle and get a little bit more of their market share, but that's like a zero-sum game, right? We get a little more market share from Nestle, they have a little less. So this is, this is, this is what we mean when we say it's more substitutive than growth enhancing. Okay? I mean, Roshan's got like a hundred different chocolate products, right? If they make a, a, a hundred and first chocolate product, they're not going to stimulate a huge growth in the chocolate industry. Nah, because the guy who used to buy the cherry flavored, he decides he now likes the orange flavored. And somebody used to buy from Nestle, now they buy from Rocha. So this is, this is usually what, what you, and there's a hell of a lot of activity, let's be clear. Hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of activity. Okay, so we don't want to underestimate this, but this is what a lot of innovations are. They're just sustaining innovation. They're cool, right? If one of you guys worked for Roshan, you might want to think about a sustaining innovation. Could it be an example of diversification? Yes. It, is it like uh, if they create a new product, and isn't it like diversification? Well, if they created, if Roshan decided to produce basketballs, oh, okay. that would be diversification. But if they decide to take a piece of popcorn and coat it with chocolate, that's oh, sort of okay. more of the same. So there is diversification, but, but unless you step outside of your, 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 your space, mm -hmm. right? And okay, we're going to produce chocolate, but we're also going to produce automobiles. Okay? Mm -hmm. So unless you step, and, and if you step outside of your space, then you're into that third category, which we're going to get to. Okay, so so these are really cool, and 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 this is if, if uh, apparently then we've only got one person working for a company. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, uh, I work for myself, so I'm technically unemployed. Right? Right? No, I mean if you say to somebody, "I'm an entrepreneur," what you're saying is, "I'm unemployed because I don't work for anybody." So it's cool to be an entrepreneur, but it also means you're unemployed. Okay. So I like being unemployed. Okay, here's the here's the, the takeaway, right? This is the powerful economic takeaway. These innovations, as many of them, as huge as they are, they, they usually, you, you were touching on an excellent point when you said, well, what about diversification? Well, they usually, unless it's a big diversification, they usually don't disrupt existing markets, okay? And if you're talking about making huge amounts of money, you have to talk about disrupting markets. And, and, and not disrupting in a bad way, like stupid Mark Zuckerberg, move fast and break things. It's the world's worst corporate slogan. He'll never live it down, <laughs> okay? So you don't want to move fast and break things. But you do want to disrupt markets, okay? Wind power and solar power are disrupting markets, big time, 
right? But they're very, very, very positive, okay? So, so they're not breaking things, but they are disrupting. Okay, um, okay. All right, um, <coughs> efficiency. All right, there's a, this is a really, really cool, let's jump to the bottom line. Spoiler alert, this, these kinds of innovations, they may, they may not, but they usually kind of probably disrupt markets, okay? Um, this, is, this is where someone comes up with an idea. Uh, it says, well, we're going to do more for less. And, and when, you, when you, do, you do more for less, it's, it's, it's a process, okay? The, again, I'm going to keep coming back to the Kiev city government cell phone app. That's an efficiency innovation. It's not a new product. Okay. It's not really disrupting a market, not really, but it's doing more for less. It's allowing people to do more public transport with less wasted time, less hassle, right? Right? less cost. So it's really like a supply chain. And I think I have up. Oh, right. It's really a, a supply chain. Now, you wouldn't normally think of a cell phone app as being sort of a supply chain, but it's really, it's really kind of a... A supply chain thing. In this case, the supply chain is moving people from their apartments to their jobs and back again, or you know, apartment to job to school to theater. <laughs> okay, so, so, um, but here's the key: it affects profits more than it affects growth. So you can think about these kinds of innovations. These kinds of innovations, by the way are literally saving the planet, because I'm not a pessimist. I believe everything is getting better, okay? It, it, really, it really is, and it's because of you guys. It's not because of, you know, old guys. It's because of you guys, okay? Um, but, but when you think about it, that cell phone app, it, it, it's going to affect some growth, because if it becomes faster, cheaper, easier to use a cell phone app through, through all this multimodal transportation, then maybe more people will use public transport. And maybe they'll use it more often. OK, that's growth. But mostly is it's going to affect profitability, because it's going to reduce people's time. Time is money, right? It's going to reduce stress. If you reduce the commuting stress of employees, they go to work and they do a better job. And if they do a better job, they're more productive and the company's more successful. So, so it's going to affect profits and growth, but mostly it's going to affect profits, okay? Um, here's a kind of a source of a lot of social problems we're having in the world today, right? You know, you know life is a double-edged sword if it's, you know, Every time you, you any, every time anybody innovates anything, there's always going to be some winners and losers, some good, some bad. What right? What, you know what can you do? Okay. Well, this is why we have government because government's supposed to come in and help those who are losing to, to rejoin the game and start winning again. Okay. Most governments, almost all governments, do a really bad job of that. Okay. Uh, especially in the United States, we're really bad at helping people who are temporarily losing, okay? Um, but most of these kind of efficiency innovations, they're, they're replacing labor with, with capital or with intangible assets, with data, with big data analytics, right? Okay. So, um, so you're having lots and lots and lots of jobs where the jobs are sometimes being eliminated completely, but mostly they're just employing less people because one person using all this efficiency innovations can do the work of 10, so one person keeps their job, nine people lose their job. It's not that the, the job goes away, it's the number of people who go away. And, and so you see a lot of this. And this is especially the case with uh, big data, big data analytics, um, especially AI, uh, right, and machine learning, any, anything in that sphere. It's, 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 it's enhancing labor, but it's also substituting, meaning reducing labor in favor of capital or intangible. All right, 
but huge activity worldwide in this area. More money being invested, more money being earned, more benefits. Um, all of the work, I'm going to show you here some of the companies doing this, um, all of the work that's being done on the global uh, food supply chain, it's all efficiency innovations like blockchain to, to follow one head of lettuce from, the, from one spot in the ground 5,000 miles away to, to, to literally the supermarket it was sold in and every step in between. And we now have all these supply chain right on the blockchain to trace one single head of lettuce. Um, that's reducing food waste. It's increasing food security. It's increasing public health. Okay, um, so that's all occurring in here. Um, and and this, this goes on in existing entities like that uh, um, first kind of innovation we talked about. Um, but it also it also goes with new entities. Okay, so this is where you find a classic startup in here, right? Um, what was Uber? Well, Uber was, was in here. Uber, Uber is in the next category, mostly. But Uber is in here because if Uber hadn't had a lot of really brilliant people to create the, the platform and work out all that supply chain from the driver to the to the rider to the to the to the to the, if 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 all of that big supply chain uh, uh, hadn't been worked out in, a, in an engineering way and in a financially sustainable way, even though they've yet to turn a profit, um, uh, if that hadn't been done uh, uh, as an efficiency innovation, then they wouldn't have been able to create you know a new market for on on because th they did create a new market. It's called on-demand transportation. Right? The subway, the buses are not on demand. Right? You go and you stand there and the bus comes or the bus doesn't come. <laughs> you know, but, but Uber and Lyft and Uplon, man, you get there and you push a couple buttons and boom. Okay? So they created a new market, but only because they first, first figured out the efficiency innovations. Okay? And so, so they were doing both. Okay? Um, I just know this isn't going to work, so I'll just push them. Oh my god, it worked! First time. All right. All right. All right. Here's, here's where you get the classic startup model, the classic private for profit model. It's in, it's in this room. But it doesn't have to be private, it doesn't have to be for profit. But if you look at, if you think of every you know, successful startup company you know, they're all in this category, okay? They, they, they tend to be private, they tend to be for-profit, they tend to be new, okay? And, and they're, they're, they're disrupting markets. So this is, this is the real, this is where the, 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 the real action is. I mean, dynamic. I'm not downplaying those other two areas. There's trillions of dollars being invested and earned in those other areas, okay? But this is, this is the dynamic, cutting edge, let's have lots of fun area. This is where uh, uh, my one Hubble company, that's not mine, I'm on the board, um, but, but, uh, but I'll say mine because okay. uh, I'm on the board. <laughs> and, and, and I was there from the beginning. It was the founder and me. Okay. But it only succeeded because he was brilliant and he took the risk and he did the work. Um, I just mainly encouraged it. Um, the point is, so let's take a look at this, because this is, this is where I think most of you are going to come back with innovation ideas in your teams, okay? Because this is where the fun is, okay? Um, we're talking here new or improved product services activities. Okay, so Uber again. Is Uber a new product or is it an improved product? Sort of both, yeah. I mean, that's that. Those efficiency investments on the supply chain made it an improved model of moving human bodies from point A to point B. But but it's absolutely a new service because there was no on-demand. There was no individual on-demand. Take me from point A to point B now. 
the transportation model until they invented it. Okay, and um, so it really did disrupt existing markets. <laughs> Go ask every established taxi cab company. Okay, <laughs> you know, and now, now actually, that that's a okay. Well, that's a fair example. It disrupted. It disrupted in a. Okay, if you're the yellow cab company in New York City, uh, you, Uber disrupted your market in a negative way. Well, that's because you had old technology, you're not moving fast enough, you're not keeping up with the times, right? Times change, you don't. Nobody wants to stand on the street anymore, wave at a taxi. Um, but, but disrupts is also a very, mostly a very, very positive thing. Because disruption, tends to create new ecosystems, okay? One of the examples I'm going to show you is, uh, is Nike and Adidas. And I think it's Nike, it's an old established company. They've created a 100% recyclable shoe. And there's another company that created a 100% recyclable cotton t-shirt. In, a, in, a, in an environmentally sustainable way. So it's a closed circle, circular economy. And that has disrupted, it's created a whole new ecosystem. Because no sooner did the company come up with a way for people to buy a t-shirt and then send the t-shirt back to the company who will recycle it into a new t-shirt, then some clever people jumped up and said, Okay, we have a new business, okay? And it's and we're going to take this cell phone app and we're going to have a subscription service where you pay some small monthly fee and, and, and that monthly fee allows you 10 new t-shirts a month. And you can go online, we've got 1,000 t-shirts. You don't like the 1,000, design the one you want. And we send the order to the factory who will produce the t-shirt, send you the t-shirt, and your t-shirt's going to come with a box. And when you're finished wearing, you can wear it once, you can wear it a thousand times. When you're finished, you put it in the box, you mail it back uh, to us, we credit you, we send it to the factory, and you get a new t-shirt. So it created a whole new business of, of e-commerce, a whole new fashion-based e-commerce, IT-based business called monthly subscriptions for t-shirts. I mean, that's really cool, man. That is really cool. And by the way, yeah, you don't have any guilt. Because you're not throwing your T-shirt in the in the in the garbage anymore. You put it in a box. You send it back, and every month, and for the same monthly fee, you're getting ten new T-shirts. Uh, you'll see them here, man. Um, this is where you have the huge profit potential. Is in this area. It's huge because it's new. It's disrupting markets. It's creating new markets. It's it's spawning the creation of of a, a big. Uh, ecosystems of new companies and you know ecos not not just like by an ecosystem I don't mean a company I buy something from I mean a company that becomes an integral part of my supply chain without whom I can't operate the company doing the recyclable monthly t-shirt subscriptions can't exist without the company that recycles t-shirts so they, they have an ecosystem, symbiotic ecosystem relationship. They're not going to get it. Okay. All right. Last slide before we go to the, to the fun. Last slide before we go to the fun. Um, this is what is so powerful about these market creating, market disrupting innovation. They're, they're, and this you probably haven't run across this concept before. They're targeting non-consumers who have unfilled needs. All right, now think about this. Uh, one of the companies I'm going to show you, and you, you're going to have to go look them up online to learn all about them. I'm going to show you the name and tell you what they do and tell you what's clever about them. One, two, three, one, two, three, done. But you can just go online. So here comes this African guy, Nigerian guy, and uh, he says, you know, uh, back in the 90s, early 90s, he says, you know, nobody in Africa has a cell phone. Well, it's true. And everybody said, well, sure, Africans are poor. That's why they don't have cell phones. And the guy said, no, they don't have cell phones because they don't have cell phones. 
Okay? Don't tell me they don't have cell phones because they're poor. Well, but they don't have cell phone towers. Well, no. So what? All right? What's the point? You had hundreds of millions of, we're talking, I think he's got 200, this is Celtel out of Nigeria. Um, they're all over the African continent. This guy said, look, we have several hundred million people who are non consumers of mobile telephony, right? Mobile telephone services. They're non-consumers. You want to make big money and access huge, vast markets? Don't target existing customers, people who already <coughs> buy chocolate, so you're competing against Nestle, right? No, no, no. You've got to target non-consumers. And this guy developed an innovation, he had an innovation idea, and he developed an innovation plan, and he developed a business model, uh, and it's a long story, I won't tell the whole story, you don't have time. The end, but what he did is he developed a way to bring affordable cell phones, uh, affordable cell phone towers, and all the ecosystem support so that people could be taught how to use cell phones and so on and so forth. And he started doing that in the 90s, and it's been like, what, 20 years, 25 years? Uh, he's a billionaire. Celtel has at least 200 million clients. You can't go anywhere in Africa in, in, without seeing somebody that has a, has a cell phone. Because he, he figured out how to sell a service to non-consumers who, who wanted the service. Who doesn't want cell phone telephony service? Everybody does. He just figured out a way to bring the service to the market in a way that worked. And that is where you make money. That's what you Isn't it make like, like I, I thought that it's more about like creating a need, like like a fad when people uh, do you know this spinner? You yeah, know, you can do that. So yeah, yeah, it's like maybe people just didn't have an experience to use the cell phone and as soon as you get this excitement you find money. There, there's an aspect of that. But notice that you, you referred to the spinner. Yes. Okay. Uh, I remember a long time ago, there was this, somebody came up with the idea of the pet rock. And they were, it was like a joke. They would put a rock in a box and you would buy it and give it as a Christmas present. It was a pet rock. Guy made bucket loads of money for a few years and then died. The, when you create a fad, when you create a need, it's, it's 99 times out of 100 it's not sustainable because you're pushing the idea into somebody's head. You need a spinner, you need a pet rock. And maybe they're dumb enough to believe you and, oh yeah, that's pretty cool, I'll get a pet rock. And then they get bored and they throw the rock away. In the case of, in the case of Celtel in, in Africa, that is a real need. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's life and death with a cell phone. I mean, we, we have now, we have, do you know there's two, more than 250,000, more than last time I saw a number was a couple of years ago, so there's way more than 250,000 cell phone apps that are, that are based on personalized medicine, right? right? Uh, uh, I mean, I've got, here, I've got, uh, my, when I bought this phone, Samsung, it came with Samsung Health. Right? So when I ride my bicycle, I walk, it's measuring the, the kilometers and the calories. That's, that's, that's a cell phone app of basic health. There's cell phone apps now that let diabetics manage. You put a little tiny chip in, a in, a, in the cell phone app, and the diabetic has 24-7 monitoring of their blood sugar, and the cell phone app's communicating with a hospital, which if you're living in a lot of, in North Dakota, or Zambia, the hospital, North Dakota is, trust me, it's, it's nowhere if you've ever looked at the map of America. So if you're in North Dakota, you're in Zambia, you can be 1,000 miles from a hospital. But that's okay because you're communicating, okay? And, and there's going to be like a local clinic, and then that doctor can communicate back to a local clinic and say, hey, I'm seeing this reading. There's something wrong with the blood sugar before the person strokes out. So... So, you know, you, th these needs are there, and once you start to fulfill the need, in this case, access to cell phone telephony, that's the word, it, it, it created a huge ecosystem. Farmers use it to check daily prices. 
right? Every millions and millions of small businesses now in Africa, everywhere in the world, you, you use this to manage your companies, check your prices, ship your product, track your product, right? You know, uh, you, you know. So once, once, once this brilliant guy found out a way to meet the unmet, the unfulfilled need of, of a couple hundred million uh, people who wanted cell phones. Once he figured out how to do it with just the first thousand people, then, then it was just now the whole issue was scale. He just had to scale it up. Now, that's easier said than done because scaling is now an efficiency innovation. So he had to figure out how to do lots of innovations to scale up his sustainable cell phone model. And once he did that, he had a couple hundred million customers and he created millions of, of, of companies all over the continent that only exist now because of that, that one innovation. So, um, so that's the key. See, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because your idea of the spinner, the spagger room at spinner school, but this is where you're pushing an idea onto the market. This is where the fun is. So most of you will probably start thinking of innovation ideas and teams in this area. And so ask yourself, okay, what does a person need that's not available? Okay, that lunatic uh, Mark Kalanick or whatever his name is, completely insane, but hey, give him credit, he invented Uber. Okay, I mean, he was standing on the sidewalk, I think in San Francisco, and it was like two in the morning, and no taxi wanted to pick him up. Okay, and, and he thought, and this is a true story, he thought, okay, wouldn't it be nice if I could just like take my phone and call a cab and it comes for me and he, he knows who I am and I know who he is and, and I've already paid in advance so I don't, he don't have to do change and he doesn't have to carry change worrying about me robbing him and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so he just asked himself a question, what does a person need that, that's, that they don't have, okay? And, and when, when, when that crazy guy, and he's completely mad, but you know, a lot of brilliant people are completely mad. And when, and when he asked himself that question, the end result was Uber, okay? Um, and then, then think about how do you turn people's problems in, in, into, into profit and a better quality of life. Profit for you, better quality of life for them. Again, the cell phone thing in Africa, was really cool. The quality of life, and the same thing happened with cell phones in every other region. I just keep mentioning Africa because of cell tells a brilliant example. You know, when you when you figure out how to solve a problem for a customer, you're not going to have one customer. You're going to have millions, and tens of millions, and maybe hundreds of millions of customers. Because if I can solve your problem, then I'm going to solve the same problem for all these other people because this is a problem we all have, okay? All right, so that's, that's what you got to think about when you think of an innovation idea. You want to do something really big, you want to like really make a lot of money, you want to do something really great for the world, you have to get into that, that, that you know, market disrupting in a good way sphere. And you, and, and, and you, and, and you don't, you don't want to say, you know, oh, well, I can make this cool product. This is where 99% of all the, in, sorry guys, it's your, your turn now. The reason that 99% of startups by engineers fail, which they do, is because engineers fall in love with their gadget, because they're engineers. It's like, but you, this is, this, this th I created this thing and it's so cool. I mean, it, it does this and it does that and it does this and I push a button and it does this and it does that. And guess what? Nobody cares because it doesn't solve a problem, right? It's a really cool gadget. It's like your spinner. Well, the spinner's cool. It spins this way and it spins that way and it spins forever and it can spin and I can spin and it doesn't solve a problem. And if it doesn't solve a human problem, human beings aren't going to buy it, they're not going to use it, and, and, and you won't have a business forever, and you won't make bucket loads of money. Okay, so, um, if you look at the world right now, these are the major innovation spaces that are out there. Okay, I, I picked these, there's others, but you know, I mean, synthetic biology, biotech, okay, we can't do, we can't do much in this class with that, okay. Um, but you see huge 
huge uh, work in these areas, okay? urban development, smart cities, which is really a subset, okay? um, circular economy, which is sustainability, food, fashion, you mentioned the recyclable t-shirts, huge activity here, huge activity uh, up here in, in smart cities, e-government, quality of life. Most cities now are deploying uh, environmental sensors all over the, the city. So they can measure uh, air quality, and they can understand where they do and don't have to start, you know, reducing the traffic or right. Okay, so there's a lot of quality of life things here, sensors and the water supply, things like that, um, and then a lot of lot of innovation going on up here in the urban sphere, transportation, housing, energy, both private, both public, for profit, not for profit. Okay. Uh, most, a lot of stuff going on in housing is, is going on in the public sphere, okay? Um, so, and supply chains, right? Data analytics, sensors, Internet of Things, okay? We got sensors. You know, some cities, we're doing this, for example, in New York City. Think of the cost. We're going about every three meters in New York City, and we're putting a sensor in the curb. You know, you got the, the street, and then you got the sidewalk, and then there's the curb, right? Okay? The thing you bump your tire against when you're trying to park, okay? Scuff up your tire, say bad words, right? We're putting sensors on the curbs. Why? Because we're innovating in big data analytics so that city transportation managers can have all the data and they can see how many parking spaces for cars, trucks, vans, uh, delivery. They can set how are they being used for how long, what times of the day, so they can better design, you know, uh, different traffic zones. Here you can park a truck, but only certain times of the day. Here you can only park a car, right? Here five minutes, here two hours. So, so you know, there's a lot of, and that supply chain, because we're trying to move people and goods in vehicles from point A to point B in a way that's the most efficient, less environmentally destructive, less time wasting. Okay, um, so oh, agribusiness is huge, absolutely gigantic. It's huge. Um, the 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 biggest. These are all the biggest areas in the world, but especially uh, agribusiness. And the agribusiness, the energy, the urban spheres, uh, this is where all the biggest activity is going on. Why? Because people have to have, people have to eat, they have to have energy, energy is life. And, you know, we got, what, 70% of the world's population is now living in cities. So, so you know, urban and food and energy, this is, this is where it's all. I, I did my, a little research. And, and I went out and I started searching around to see uh, what are these green funds, right? We all know what a, a you know, green venture capital funds. Trillions of dollars in these funds now, but they will not invest in, you know, weapons or coal mines or anything like that. They're going to invest only in environmentally friendly you know, recyclable, biodegradable, circular economy, et cetera, et cetera, green. It's all the green economy. And, and there's, a, there's more money in there than you can imagine. I, I roughly, I stopped counting when I hit a trillion dollars that's either been invested recently or is ready to be invested. It's a big money. Um, and these are the areas, right? right? I'll let you look at that because you're going to get a copy of all these slides. Here's other areas, we've already touched on these, and some of the sub-areas, right? Circular economy, this is huge, recycling and reuse. Um, mobility, buildings, this is where green, green venture capital funds are putting their money. Um, all right, you're going to get a copy of all of this, so I'm not going to give you a big explanation because there's too many of them. But here's just some examples. And I picked these examples. Remember the slide where I said private for profit, private not for profit, public, and NGOs, and da da da. All right, I grabbed examples, and these are these are examples that, that 
that are in every one of those categories. Okay, um, you've got social responsibility innovation. I, I just created that category. Okay, but look at this. All right, here's a company that makes a mobile app to support the vision impaired. Okay. A, 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 a person who is blind, and they want to walk down the street, they take a stupid cane, tap, 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 and they got to listen for the, if you're in America, forget Kia, <laughs> if you're in America, you stand at the, at the stoplight, and it will tell you, green, walk now, okay? So it's trying to, you know, help people who, who are vision impaired, okay? In Kia, it doesn't matter, you can be killed on the sidewalk with perfect eyesight, okay? <laughs> so, okay, the point is, the point is, uh, I, I, if you want to know how it works, I, have, I won't, we don't, it'll take too much time, but, it, but it's a really cool app, okay? And you got a little headset, and it literally, it's literally GPS, and, and it's like 3D, and it literally, it literally says there's a desk one meter to your right, a desk to your left. And it literally manages step by step by step, okay, real time. Um, that's that's probably I can't remember. I think that's being done by a NGO, uh, probably funded by charities or the government. But, but you know, but yeah, they may be selling it too. I don't know. Um, here's a one of those two hundred and fifty thousand health apps. This is cool. So you're sitting out hundreds of miles. Um, from an MRI, you guys know what MRI is, right? Um, the magnetic, you know, you lie down in the hospital and you go through the machine and it takes a 3D reading, okay? And it says, hey, your liver's in bad shape, stop drinking, stuff like that, okay? Th the problem is those machines are enormously expensive. There aren't very many of them in the world. And a lot of countries, you might have one in a capital city, and then you got 10 million people who don't have access to one. So here comes a cell phone app. I'm using these because you guys like cell phones. This is the, you're not millennials, you're the app generation. You're, you're millennials. Millennials. <laughs> so this is a, a, a cell phone app that literally lets you do an MRI scan of yourself which saves a lot of time and a huge amount of money, and, and then it sends it off to a hospital, which could be hundreds of miles away, a doctor can look at the MRI, and okay. So um, this is cool. This is being done by an NGO, funded by um, various governments. Um, you got a lot of countries, a lot of your countries, <laughs> especially if you're up there in Kashmir nowadays, <laughs> Where you know you 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 don't have access to information because the government is censoring all the information. Russia does this like crazy, and China, North Korea, all these totalitarian states. They do. Zimbabwe is awful. They do this. Too. Yeah, I used to work for Mugabe too. I'll tell you. Before he was a homicidal maniac, I worked for him right after independence, and he hadn't gone insane yet. He was like a really brilliant guy. So, how about that? I worked for two African presidents. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So, so what the uncensored playlist does is so cool, right? Think Spotify. You can't censor music. You can censor uh, news. You can censor like the Chinese do, block CNN and okay, block BBC, uh, like the Russians do. But you can't censor music. So what, what, what Uncensored Playlist does is they take, the mu they take the news and they put it to music. And they say, Putin is a bad man, he's killing a journalist. Okay, no, I'm just making it. But they put all this news into music, and then you just, down, you just download it on Spotify or iTunes or whatever, and you get your, you get your, and even the Chinese haven't figured out how to block this yet. It's driving, and they're smart, so, okay, that's cool. Um, all right, here's this sphere, renewable energy, climate change. And these guys, right? These guys, energy vault. Solar energy stored as bricks for power generation. Here's a very clever innovation idea for you. Okay, you've got a solar plant, and it's generating more electricity at certain times of the day than you can feed into the, into the system, and that's going to be consumed. 
So now you're just losing that. You can put it into batteries. Batteries are expensive, and the batteries don't hold the energy forever. So these guys say, hey, we got a cool idea. We, we designed these special towers. And you take this excess electricity from a solar plant, and you use it to, to push huge blocks of stone to the top of a tower. Right? Now it's got that latent energy. And, and, and then the sun goes down, and then you need more electric energy, and, and you let, it's like a hydroelectric power station, right? You let the, you let the, you let the, the, the bricks, the rocks come down, and they, they generate uh, air pressure, which drives a turbine, which generates electricity. Same concept as a hydroelectric dam, right? The water comes through, pushes a turbine, okay? This is really clever, okay? Really, really clever. And you don't have to have all these very large, expensive uh, lithium-ion batteries. Yeah. India, oh, there's so many. You guys probably, you probably recognize some of these. These are all Indian companies, mm -hmm. um, except that I think is somewhere. I think that's probably Nigeria. A um, lot of innovation in Nigeria. These are electric, you know, uh, uh, rickshaws. You know, um, so instead of these gasoline-powered, diesel-powered. Where you, they just destroy the environment and kill people. I mean, if you've been to, <laughs> as I have, lots and lots of cities, you can't breathe because of these, right? So these guys, they're producing them in India. They're, they're electric. They're replacing, uh, you know, uh, fossil fuel power. They're disrupting a whole ecosystem because now you've got to have new startups who know how to repair them and maintain them, right? And et cetera, and et cetera. So again, if you want to know more, go, go to the name. Um, this is Nigeria here. They're doing the same thing. But what they've done here is they're using motorcycles because a lot of cities in Africa, they don't have those Indian, Pakistani little three-wheeled rickshaw things, they have motorcycles, also Vietnam, okay? And, and what they did is they also then made it on demand. They made it app on demand. So it's like Uber for an electric motorcycle. Um, okay. Uh, here's a few more. Uh, food space, okay? You've got companies now, and it's, it's not like if you're interested in food space, you don't have to go out and, and actually like go to the laboratory and create a, a vegan a vegan sausage. You can assume that you have one and just show that in my country, here's a market that I think could exist. These are vegan alternatives to, to meat. And uh, Impossible Foods just raised several billion dollars in its IPO, several billion, each one of these. Um, they're being sold now in supermarkets. All the you know Burger King, those horrible fast food things, are now beginning to serve you know plant-based uh, uh, meat substitutes. This is being done in the dairy. Scientists figured out how to. Uh, there's a protein named whey. W W H E Y. Whey is 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 the protein that gives all the energy value. To, to dairy products, milk and cheese and ice cream. Okay, well, but still, if you're gonna have milk, cheese, ice cream, you gotta have cows, you gotta have sheep, they create lots of environmental problems. So these guys figured out how to produce that same protein that is in, say, cow's milk in the lab, and they're using that now, they're selling that to all these companies who produce ice cream, and, and, for example, and cheese, and they're using that that, um, so now they can make uh, ice cream with the same protein as, as cow's milk, but without the cow's milk, but the same genetic protein that's in the cow's milk, okay? This is cool, again, billions of dollars. Um, something really simple, every, every, every country on earth has greenhouses, okay? But the, the, the trick with a green, you know, a greenhouse where in January it's cold but you're growing tomatoes, okay? The key, though, is you've got to get them at the right scale. You, gotta, you have to do all those, like Uber, you have to first figure out the efficiency innovations, how to, how to produce on a large enough scale, how to transport, how to track through some blockchain supply chain. Okay, so here came these clever Americans, and they figured out how to do that. 
and they created the largest greenhouse in America. It's actually the largest in the world. Are you ready for this? This thing is 300 million square meters. Okay, I mean this thing is as big as Kiev Oblast. I mean, it's one greenhouse, and it sits in a location. You know, this is a class about American geography, but it sits in a location that gives them equidistant transportation to 70% of the American population. And they, this thing is so huge, it takes, it takes like a few hours to drive from one end of the warehouse to the other. It's huge. Okay? But, but to do this, they had to solve all the innovation in that, um, in that uh, uh, efficiency innovation sphere. Okay, the reason, but it is market disrupting because now if you're a traditional, they're concentrating on high value added things like to tomatoes and peppers, mostly come from Mexico. So Mexico now is facing a huge decline in their ability to export tomatoes and peppers. That's creating some social problems there, people losing jobs. So, you know, as human beings, the two governments ought to be working together. But, you know, the current American government doesn't work with anybody, okay? Hey, give us another year and a half and we'll solve that problem. Um, but but this, this sounds like kind of, you know, mid-20th century kind of boring stuff. Well, it's not. It, it, you, 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 you know, 1950s, you, 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 you'd be lucky to have a greenhouse the size of this uh, room because you also have to figure out how to supply energy. They're, they have one of the world's largest solar farms that's going to supply energy. They're going to recycle 100% of the water, right? So it's going to be a 100% circular, sustainable, agricultural uh, thing, okay? So it's going, to, it's going to create all kinds of stimulation for ecosystem development. Um, here's, here's, uh, here's a great blockchain. Right? You've got a supply chain. In this blockchain now, it's specially designed. If you don't know what blockchain is, go Google it. It's a specially designed blockchain uh, ledger, digital ledger, specially designed for small farmers. So now a small farmer can can you know contact a a restaurant, say in Nairobi, but you're living off in the Rift Valley, and you can do a contract and you can ship your product and you can track it every step of the way, all the way. You can cut out the middlemen and ship directly to the final consumer. Hope the middlemen don't burn your greenhouse down. <laughs> That's a different problem. Um, so, so this one is really cool. Somebody came up with a, it's a wax. Some clever scientist developed a wax. It's odorless, tasteless, colorless. And you spray it on the fresh vegetables, and it very greatly, and of course it's biodegradable. You don't even know it's there. Okay, but it's actually like a like a one molecule one molecule thick layer. So you don't even know you're eating it. Okay, it's like literally micro level, like one molecule thick. No, no, no. It's it's uh, if it if it got. If it got uh, approval through the American Food and Drug Administration, I guarantee you it's safe. Okay, no, no hanky panky and bribery going on there. Not yet. Uh, but it's a food coating, and, and it greatly extends the life. So right now, thirty. Hmm, go ahead. Do we have it on fruits that are sold here in Korea? No, this is very new, and it's right now it exists. Yeah, not yet. It give. A few years, everyone in the world will be using this. And this right company, now, we also have kind of something that's small pollution thing that is covered, like, that apples are covered, the yeah. shop and so on, yeah. and it's harmful, like pretty harmful. Right, and, and this isn't. That's why these guys, again, these guys are raising billions in, 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 in funding for the company because it's solving a problem. 30% uh, of all the food that's produced in the world is wasted. Okay, it's lost in the supply chain, it rots in the supermarket, you put it in your refrigerator, and you say, oh, oh it, 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 that, it looks old, you throw it away. And this extends by a factor of three or four the, the life of, of, of uh, fruits and vegetables. 
So, so you're, you're, you're really radically reducing the amount of waste in food. And remember, if you throw out one tomato, you're throwing out a lot of land, herbicides, pesticides, fertilizer. <laughs> okay, and we got to get away from that shit too, but, but okay. Um, that's another one of these cell phone apps. This is somewhere, I can't remember, I think it's in Indonesia somewhere. Uh, but again, it's a digital marketplace for small farmers to let them uh, manage their lives. And by the way, if I'm a small farmer and I know what my prices are because I have a digital platform and I can contract with a restaurant to send my tomatoes and I can cut out the middleman, I'm going to have, not only am I going to have more efficiency, more production, more income, I'm going to have more dignity. Don't underestimate how important it is for human beings to feel like we're more in control of our lives. We have more dignity. We don't have just one local middleman coming and saying, I'm going to buy everything you produce because you have nobody else to sell to but me. By the way, this is the problem with Ukrainian agriculture. Everybody says Ukrainian agriculture is a success story. It's actually a disaster if you look at it because you've got four huge agribusiness companies, Americans and Chinese mostly, and they are buying everything that's being produced and they're dictating the prices because the farmers, they can't own land, so they can't create their own companies and so they can't compete and they're forced to lease the land at some dirt cheap, <laughs> no pun intended, some dirt cheap price. So all the profits going to Cargill and Syngenta from China and the profits all overseas and, and this is, by the way, something that privatizing land, agricultural in Ukraine, is intended to solve. To give some, what economists call agency, okay, some power over your own economic relations. And as human beings get more power over their own economic relations, they don't just have a better life economically, they have a better life psychologically, because they have dignity. You know, human dignity is important. All right, I think we're, uh, I think this is the last one. Um, I'm just trying to give you lots of ideas here. Okay, circular economy, advanced manufacturing. Manufacturing is not dead. Okay, everybody says, oh, America, America manufacturing is that nonsense. There's more gross revenue and there's more net profit in manufacturing in America today than any time in our history. We just moved from low value of manufacturing, like iron and steel and, and you know, right? You know, the, kind of stuff that, say, Ukraine is producing, and we've moved to super uh, high-tech advanced manufacturing, the kind of super alloys you put in an F-35 invisible jet plane, okay? So there's a lot of money in that stuff. Okay, uh, Adidas and Nike, these are the guys I told you about. They're making recycled shoes. They're making biodegradable shoes. Very disruptive, creating whole new ecosystems, all kinds of new spin-off businesses. Um, um, here's a device just now under development, uh, and, 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 and this is going to be really useful for cities. Um, this is, and it's being developed under the uh, stewardship of, of, a, of a big city in America. So this is, you know, public project, okay? And this little device, it's a little handheld device, and you go and you, 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 you just, it's got a little infrared, little like camera thing, and you put it on a tin can, and it says, yes, it's recycled. You put it on this type of plastic, it says that type is not recyclable, so don't screw up the recycling process and put that plastic bag in the recycle, put it in the garbage. And so these things can be produced really cheap, and what they're going to do is they're going to start producing um, big garbage cans like you see in the farm building, and these, these devices are cheap, and they'll be stuck on the side of the embedded so they can't be stolen. <laughs> They'll be embedded into the garbage can, and then you can bring a big bag, and you can say, oh, I got this kind of plastic, oh, not recyclable, I got this, oh, recyclable, right? And this is going to stimulate recycling and make it more efficient and more productive, and that's really cool. Uh, Ukrainian startup. This guy's a freaking genius. I'm trying to track him down so we can come talk to you. This guy is, he's not, he, he, by the way, this is completely... Uh, uh, sustainable, recyclable, environmentally. His, what he's doing is he's taking, um, uh, uh, you know, junk metal and 
from planes and trains thing, and he's recycling the metal, and he's using this metal to produce mechanical models that people can buy through his website, and he ships them all the pieces, and they build the, the model, and, and they build it with no glue, okay? And it's all coming from recycled metal, so he's taking all this metal and he's turning it into powder and using the powder to then, you know, under a temperature to 3D print a little model of a car, a train. Brilliant guy. He went on to Kickstarter and he raised $430,000 on uh, Ukrainian Kickstarter. Uh, okay, I'm going to let you look at the rest of these so we'll go home. Um, but if you look at these, you're going to see more and more of this recycled t-shirts. This is, I already told you this, the company that recycles the t-shirts in an utterly environmentally sustainable way, so they don't use any chemicals, no dyes, no water. They, they figured out how to take a t-shirt and, and tear it down into the individual cotton fibers and, and then use those cotton fibers to, to produce new t-shirts. And as soon as they started doing that, this company came along and set up a t-shirt subscription service. Wear, wear it, send it back, get a new one. Pay a monthly fee. You can get five per month, ten per month. If you got a lot of kids, twenty per month. And, and they're, they're doing the t-shirt the subscription, and the ones they get back, they send over to these guys because they're only selling the recycle. So this is how an innovation uh, uh, can 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 do all the good stuff we like and be environmentally sustainable, be you know do, do you know the climate mitigation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and still generate uh, uh, you know spin-off companies, generate an ecosystem. All right. That one I will not read, um, but you can. Here's all I'm going to tell you about that. Don't assume a market doesn't exist. Just assume you can create one. And I've already told you about this brilliant guy at Celtel. Okay? He did not assume there's no market for cell phones and cell phone telephony services in Africa. He assumed he could create a market for mobile telecoms in Africa, and he did, and he's a billionaire. So so because, you know, unfulfilled needs, non-consumption, okay? So don't, and, and there's everything here. You can go look these guys up. Man, there's everything from noodles to bread to, to you know, you name it. And you can look all of those up. Fill out the questionnaire, and we'll go home. Okay. All right. Questions, comments, otherwise? I just figured we had to stop because we talked again. And she only comes when I've been talking to her. That's all.